Welcome to this podcast from the Human Capital Institute's Leadership Hiring Assessments, What's New and What Works. This program was brought to you by The Ladders. Charles Handler, PhD, owner of Rocket Hire LLC, recently discussed the use of executive assessment tools with a live audience of HCI members. He began by examining the predictive accuracy of job performance and the predictor content of assessments. Considered separately, each has zero predictive accuracy. It's only when both are closely integrated that we can draw accurate meaning. Hear about some new models and techniques for developing best practices for leadership assessments. What is leadership? Um, uh, it has been really, really an elusive thing. It's one of those things where we kind of know it when we see it, but there's no one model that shows how people lead and how leadership works. It's a very fragmented thing, and it's something that we're continually striving to understand and really wrap our arms around. So I just have kind of a summary here, and I found this website where this URL is, um, has a really great summary of all the kind of academic theories and things that have been put forth around what leadership is. I don't want to get into those too much, but these are kind of the highlights. So at the beginning, and, and we, we really had this leaders are born, not made, the great man. I call it the great person theory just because I think that's a little bit more correct. But that, that, that there's people that are out there that are special and unique, and they change uh, history. Um, and, you know, that we all know that's true in some cases. There's the behavioral theory also that leadership is not just what you're born with, but that you can cultivate it as well. Then there's also the idea that, you know, that a really good leader is someone that knows how to involve others to their strengths, knows how to delegate, knows how to really get other people engaged. Um, another important theory is that leadership is highly variable depending on any type of factors in the situation, so that you can't always just say that in one situation someone's always going to be a leader. There's always uh, things that are contingent that allow that to be, uh, allow some leadership abilities to sh shine through. Uh, and then the, the other the other two kind of final things are the, the transactional view. That is, you can motivate people by dangling certain carrots and certain sticks in front of them. You can you can press buttons and uh, and get people uh, by via rewards and other transactional things to do things for you. And then there's kind of the transformational viewpoint, which is I think the the more romanticized version that we all think about when we think of a leader, and that's people who who will inspire, you know, the, the Yoda character, people that'll, uh, that basically um, will follow you if you have inspiration, passion, vision, wisdom to impart to them. So how do we select leaders? This is a really good uh, example here in terms of, uh, you know, again, the whole paradigm we're looking at is hitting the bullseye. So let's talk a little bit about the retained search fund. And I, I'm not my image down there, as you can probably tell, I, I pull cultural icons and things that I feel are meaningful to me personally uh, and put them in here. So um, this isn't a dig on uh, in search firms as being incompetent uh, by showing one of our favorite incompetent um, searchers there, but but it's more just kind of showing that uh, that it is detective work and that sometimes it is not always easy and uh, it, 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 there's a little bit of randomness and spontaneity that can go with it sometimes. But here's, I just listed the names of some firms here. And, you know, how do they work? They really work uh, based on an evaluation of fit and expertise and competency-based interviews. They use those search consultants. They don't always use a lot of testing. And, you know, honestly, uh, retained search firms really are a – they have a sales component to them. Um, you know, they make a lot of money, uh, oftentimes a third of an executive salary. You know, so that's, uh, that's going to be quite a bit. Um, if you think about some of these executive level folks and what their compensation packages look like. Um, and it's really, again, it's a sales process in both directions, I think, sometimes. So assessment firms, what do they look like? Who are they? There's a lot of them out there, a lot. And uh, there's, there's, you know, really I have them kind of divided into three strata. And these are people that do assessments for executive level stuff. So you have your big firms like your PDI and your PDI. Those are probably some two of the biggest players. At a global level, they're doing a lot of these executive assessments. Then there's a lot of smaller firms where maybe it's just two or three individual psychologists that work together. Um, and, you know, there's probably easily 100 of those, I would say, out there. And then uh, below that, you just got individuals. You've got a lot of licensed psychologists who they're not always even – so my background is organizational psychology, but oftentimes you'll find clinical or even social psychologists – 
uh, people with PhD level, uh, you know, education and a lot of experience in relating to humans in any way, and that's what psychologists do. So there's a lot of folks out there that have very nice practices based on just um, being one individual who's a hired gun that goes out and, uh, and does these assessments uh, for, for people. We'll look at what the content of those assessments uh, looks like stuff. So, so first of all, let's revisit our paradigm we talked about. Uh, it is the same in terms of defining, measuring, making decisions, and evaluating. There's, there's really no difference in those key points. Uh, and let's, let's talk a little bit about the evaluation side of things, like how is executive success evaluated? We've touched on that a lot already, um, and so I'm just going to skim through these. The evaluating success is much harder. It's not really based on the same paradigm. Uh, and it's really about these large-scale goals. Um, one of the things that I haven't really um, stated enough, and I can't overstate it, is how traumatic or fatal mistakes can be at this level. And if you think about you're guiding a company's future and you make a decision that, oh, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to invest in, you know, a warehousing strategy and we need to go out and spend, you know, a billion dollars of capital to put all these warehouses in, and that strategy fails, uh, that's a lot different than, you know, dropping a can of soup and on the floor and having, a, having to lose some of your inventory at a grocery store. You know, it's a, it's a big, big difference. Um, and that attitude and mindset are some things that are really hard to evaluate, but it's that kind of we know it when we see it. I touched on that already. So that fit component, and that's the real interesting thing. You know, we talk about all these various data collection measures and all these highly paid people who are coming together to make these decisions, they can't always tap into just how well this person is going to fit. And a lot of times it's just that, that happens when the rubber beats the road and the person goes to work. And we talk about the stakes being higher. The, the other thing that I think is kind of implied, we all know, is that, you know, executive levels, the, the interesting thing about it is the compensation packages are humongous. And not only that, when these people, there's always these clauses where when and if these people need to be ushered out rapidly, um, it's always financially advantageous for them to do it. I mean, I always have this thing in my mind of, like, what a great racket to just, you know, be a CEO and you go different places for two years, and so what if you don't get results? You move on to another place, and like I said, there's such a small cadre of people available for these type of jobs. It almost seems like it could be a racket for you, or you could you could just keep getting these great um, retirement packages, or you know, golden parachutes, or whatever they call them. Uh, we've all we've all seen you know a lot about that in the media and stuff. So that, here's where the, that stuff becomes a reality, and those dollars are real.